Well, thank you. Thank you all for being here, toughing it out until the very last end. Um, thank you, Maria and Angel, for putting this session together. Um, I've been coming to OCV for a long time, and I really, really enjoyed this meeting. It would not be possible without Mary and Heather and now May. So please, let thank them. A big round of applause for Mary, who's outside, and Heather. So thank you. Um, the other thing that we wouldn't be able to give our talks if it wasn't for the gentleman that's up there who hasn't, we, we don't see him, but he sees us. And he makes sure that our wireless is functioning, that our talks are loaded, that everything is flawless. So please, let's thank him as well. And I'm going home with a couple pounds more. Did everybody enjoy the catering? Was it, it's been, that's why I come to the meeting, I'm joking. But it's part of the reason why I come, honestly. So let's give a big round of applause for our caterers. Who's, they always have a smile on, so they've been awesome. So um, it's like, like I said, I really, I love this meeting, um, but it's not about me, it's, it's, a, it's about time series. Um, but you know what? It is about me, because everybody that knows me knows that I have this crazy love for time series. And what really is not to love about time series? They're dependable, they are committed. Where do you find commitment nowadays? You just don't. Um, you always know where to find them, Whenever you need them, they'll be there. Um, they love to interact with other groups. They really do. They love when you, when you go visit them. Um, and they're never boring. They always come up with new things. And you know what? I'm not the only nut job that's just crazy about time series. There's, well, obviously, there's plenty of us out here that are nut jobs. Um, but when we did, for example, IGMITS, the International Group for Marine and Ecological Time Series, we collected over 340 time series globally. And actually now there's like more like 400, and these are ship-based time series. Um, the autonomous platforms, which is the figure at the, at the bottom, you know, we've populated our ocean, and granted, these are really tiny dots compared on a map, so it looks pretty full, but we've done a really good job about populating the oceans with autonomous assets. And of course, we have our satellite fleets, which honestly, we would not have a clue on how our ocean and our, our land works if it wasn't for the synoptic view of the planet. So why, since IGMETS was, you know, we did our report and all of that, why over the past four years have seven time series over a decade long, the longest 22 years folded? Why can't we sustain these time series? And so that kind of got me thinking. I was like, well, what do people think about time series? And so I called up a good friend of mine, Todd O'Brien. Um, he is one of my IGMETS co-chairs. And I said, Todd, is there a way that we can gauge, kind of, you know, are people searching the internet for time series? How do we do that? And so he came back to me a day later and he said, you know, there's something really cool that's Google Trends. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Google Trends. It's not really scientific, so bear with me for the next five minutes. Um, but it's, it was quite fun to look at, you know, what people are searching. So I went into Google Trends and I, I said, well, what do we search first? Well, let's go with climate change. So what? What are people looking in terms of climate change? And how you read these graphs is, I put in a year, a year's worth of time, and I put a global view um, to sort of pull global data. And basically, this is just the popularity of the search term. So that means that if it's 100%, it's a really popular term over that time period. If it's 50%, it's one half as popular. If it's close to zero, it's, there's not enough data. So I was like, well, that's, you know, it's pretty cool. There are some instances where people are searching more about climate change, sometimes where it's less, but it's a pretty consistent picture. So I was, you know, I, I wasn't disheartened. But then I thought, well, what about something else that also is popular? Because we need to put this into perspective. So I was like, well, ah, dinosaurs. Dinosaurs sounds cool. So I was pretty, you know, I wasn't disheartened um, because, you know, it, it is a little bit more popular than climate change, but it's not that bad. And so one of the things that I, maybe your eye also goes to like the very top, and I was like, wow, this probably has to do with the two new species of dinosaurs that were just discovered in Australia. One of them was named after former President Barack Obama, the other named after um, Sir David Attenborough. And I, was, I thought it was thrilled. I was like, well, that's probably what it is. Well, it turns out that when you do your, your, your Google trends, you actually see where, what these terms are. Um, 
and that, that peak is actually related to Jurassic World. So anyway. <laughs> so OK, so that's, you know, both dinosaurs and climate change are kind of scientific. They're not really telling me what you know, the regular Joe or the regular Jane are thinking. So I thought, well, what else can we, you know, what can I compare it to that's been really popular over the past you know, year or so? So I looked at what the British royal family is doing. And so that's how it compares. And I'll let you figure out what that bimodal distribution is like. So, you know, okay, fine, we're not that pop as popular as the, as, the, as the royal British family. And then I thought, being a soccer fan, I was like, well, how, does, how do, you know, climate change and, you know, dinosaur and all of this compare to, say, the World Cup? And you know what? We could go extinct tomorrow, as long as people had a way to watch the games. So, anyway. So that, okay, fine, that was, which, that, that was a lot of fun for me, but it wasn't really scientific. It doesn't really bring us back to why we're here talking about time series. And so I was like, okay, let me search ocean time series. And nothing came up. So I, I wasn't discouraged. I said, like, well, maybe the term is not search as often. So maybe there's something else that we can search for. And so I searched for ocean observations. And so it was, it's interesting, okay, so people search for ocean observations on and off. Um, there really is little data about what people search for, so I couldn't really get anything significant in terms of what it is that people search for ocean observations. Um, but then I thought, you know, we've got to put it in the context of people. So say, how do ocean observations compare to something like ecosystem services? Oops. And so there is, the first thing that I noticed was, um, well, ecosystem services is searched more than ocean observations. And the questions that are asked is, what is, what are ecosystem services and that sort of thing. But what I noticed was this difference. And the first thing that told me was that people are interested in ecosystem services. And by the way, I also did the same thing for ocean acidification. It plots pretty much really close to where ecosystem services is. And again, the questions was, questions were, what is ocean acidification? How do you um, curb ocean acidification? That sort of thing. So people are interested in these things, but they have no idea how you actually get the data to understand ocean acidification. They don't understand how you get the data to know how that your ocean is healthy. And to be honest, and Francisco just did a phenomenal example of ocean acidification. Sustained ocean observations are the only means we have to assess ocean acidification in the ocean and see what the trends are. So there is a disconnect between how people view these things that for them are important and what, how you get those data. So thanks, I was like, well, let's think about something related to food. So let's talk about fisheries. And there is a great interest in fisheries. Bear in mind, there's a lot that goes into the term fisheries. So this one is probably a little lower when you look strictly at fisheries for food security. Um, but there, it, it is more popular. Again, the, the difference between ocean observations and fisheries is the, the distance is abysmal. Um, <clears throat> I put in oceanography just for the heck of it. Um, mostly what people are searching in terms of oceanography are schools, so Scripps, Hui, you know, all these schools for education is mostly what people search for in terms of oceanography. Again, look at the blue bar that you can barely see there, ocean observations, it doesn't, it barely makes it into the map. And then when I put in climate change, that dramatic different difference really got me thinking because what this told me was first, when people look at climate change, they're not thinking about the oceans. They're thinking about something else. So oceans doesn't necessarily register when they're thinking about climate change. Um, and second, observations, again, are completely divorced from understanding what really is driving climate change, how can we mitigate it, how can we predict uh, potential changes in the future. And so the bottom line here is that regular people, regular folks that we interact with on a daily basis don't get ocean observations, and much less sustained ocean observations. Um, and, you know, let's, let's be honest, sustained ocean observations have to even fight with their own scientific community to get funding, because they're not sexy, they're not necessarily state of the art, they do the same boring thing over and over again, and don't come up with anything cutting edge, except when they do, because the length of the, of the record is what gives them the advantage and the possibility to do real cutting edge science. And so we have to keep track of this. We have to keep this in mind. And I was very impressed yesterday with the um, Southern Ocean Talks because a lot of them hinged on sustained ocean observations. And so they let us understand the baseline and how changes are occurring into our ecosystems. And they are helping models. And I really enjoyed Matt's talk yesterday of models because 
uh, policy makers uh, and decision makers are not necessarily interested in the 2100 model. They're interested in what's happening in the next 10 to 20 years. And modelers, correct me if I'm wrong, throw a shoe at me, it's okay, I'll duck. Um, but they, modelers are not, models are not really doing well when it comes to short term because that short term variability is really hard to capture. So we need something that feeds into the model's high frequency data that you can validate your model against. And then that is what is actually needed to make those decisions that policymakers need. So we need to give them what they need. Okay, so what's in store for time series? That was actually the title of my talk, so I'm gonna circle back to that. Are we gonna go extinct like dinosaurs? Uh, probably not. Are we gonna die a horrible death like Corporal Maggio here in the movie? By the way, how many people have actually watched the movie? Okay, it's better than I expected. It's, it's kind of a depressing movie, but you know, it was, it's the, it was the time. So, you know, we're, we're, we're not, Tempsies are not gonna go extinct, that's for sure. We're not gonna have the popularity of the World Cup either. But one thing is for sure. Now, it's, it's a time of change. There's a lot of things that are happening. And if time series and sustained observations want to continue forward, we're gonna have to change. We're gonna have to change how we're doing business. And there's no need to panic, but we're gonna have to think outside the box on how we sustain these ocean observations. <clears throat> One of the first things that we need to do, oops, Oh, that's really odd. So there's supposed to be text here. You can, you can put whatever text you want, um, but I'll tell you what text should be in here. So in the center, we should have sustained ocean observations. And all around here, we should have the MBON type time series, we should have um, autonomous time series, we should have ship-based time series. So basically, we need to start working more synergistically across all the different platforms that measure that have sustained observations, including LTERs. And so we have to put our big egos aside, because as scientists, we generally don't wanna, oftentimes we don't wanna play with others. So we have to put that aside and actually start working synergistically because what we're finding is that we're duplicating a lot of things that already exist, just because I'm not gonna go down and talk to my neighbor. And I really enjoyed uh, Ralph's talk and, and how he showcased all these different um, additional programs that are being synergistic with Cal Coffee. And that's, that's really where we need to go. So we need to really make an effort to do that. And I understand we not necessarily have the time to put that together, so we, it, it is a struggle. And the most important thing is that we need to remember that two-legged species are important. In a time where uh, policymakers are struggling to, with, with finite funding and they need to have the people fed and they need to keep the people happy, they're, they're really gonna think about where they wanna make the investment. So we need to make sure that whatever we do in terms of time series is relevant for the people. Um, and so we, as scientists, are really not equipped to think about those things. And we generally don't talk to other, you know, to normal people, not that we're not normal, but we generally try to stay within, you know, you go to a party, who do you, who do you talk to when you go to a party? A scientist, because you know they get you. You turn it out for someone else and you know, it just doesn't work out. Um, so we need to, it's gonna get out of our comfort zone, but the other thing that we need to do is, because we're not trained to talk to, or to put things into the social context, we need to really start embracing social scientists. And that doesn't mean that you're gonna go home and you're gonna hug a social scientist. That means that you have to really rope them in to the program that you're running and make sure that whatever questions you're asking are actually relevant for people. How can you frame your research in terms of a need that someone that a stakeholder will need, will, will, be, will make use of. And uh, Gabriel hinted at this this morning, and Tatiana, thank you for asking that question, like how the heck do we sustain these things? And so stakeholders and fundamental, I'll come, back, I'll come back to that. Oh, I forgot about that. So um, just to, and as, an, as an example of time series, um, how many people missed the lobster yesterday? <laughs> So they're generally, how many of you have actually come to more than one OCB? Okay, right, so you know, are you, are you used to lobster during the, the dinner? Did you miss the lobster last night? Okay, I was so, I'm not a lobster person, I never eat lobster. I always, I'm, a, I'm the one that gets the meat. Um, but I was so shocked not to see the lobster that I went to Mary and I was like, Mary, what's, what's going on? Where's the lobster? I'm kind of shocked. And she said the lobster catch this year has been so low the prices were astronomical. So we could not afford to buy lobster for the OCB. So what do you think the regular person 
that goes to the supermarket and has to buy the lobster and is used to getting the lobsters kind of thing. How do we put that into context? And it's funny because Maria, I, was, I just told Maria, I'm like, I'm going to show a slide from one of your papers. I think you planned it all, honestly, because she, she published this paper uh, last year where they're showing time series, long-term time series of um, bottom temperatures increasing. And then um, Maria, Scott, and Jenny have a paper. And I just, I wanted to put this out here. They basically state oceanographic conditions are going to move larvae away from the coast if the warming is sustained. So no lobster. So don't you think that's going to really drive the point home to someone? But they, they're missing that connection. How do you actually know that you're not going to have your lobster on the table? How do you know the prices are going to go up if you don't have these sustained observations? So what can we do in order for us to, for, for a time series to change, to be able to sustain themselves, to you know, get more funding? So one of the things we've already mentioned, you know, synergistic things, synergistic activities, talk to people, have, have a better interaction, bring in social scientists, and when I mean have, a, have a more, more interactions with people, I mean get creative, think outside the box. So think about you're gonna walk into a supermarket and you're gonna see an Argo float right next to your fish, where you buy your fish. How many people that walk into a supermarket, not, not in Woodhull, that's not a uh, representative example, but how many people that walk into a supermarket have seen an Argo float? I would say 99% have not. And those things are cool looking. So, you know, every single kid that's going to walk through that door is going to be drawn to that yellow thing. And, there, and you know, people might be interested in going like, well, this is, the, this is a weird thing. What does it do? Well, it actually, let me tell you, it measures temperature and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, there are creative ways that we can entrain people, that we can, we can do this, what they're called, what's called ocean literacy. So we have to walk outside our comfort zone, and this is going beyond what we're, what we're used to defining as broader impacts. So stakeholder engagement, as I mentioned, it's fundamental. And when you're talking to a stakeholder, don't show, just, just don't showcase the problem, like your water quality is state. Just so go and say, look, this is your problem, and this is our solution. This is what we can offer you. And what's really popular now is a scenario-based decisions. So you basically showcase the stakeholders what different avenues that they can take are going to give them. And that really, that works well because policymakers do not always understand what their decisions are and what those can entail. Um, and always remember, in a global context, nations are always choose what's best for them, not necessarily what's right. So we want to make sure that we, that we, um, oh, that's almost out of time. Sorry. Um, that we, make sure that we try to get them into the right direction with the information that we have. And so this is my last slide for this, so it's good because I'm almost out of time. Um, coming back to the data, <clears throat> time series have a ton of data, but what we need in terms of for societal needs are fit for purpose data. We can't force our data on someone, even though we think it's the most fabulous data that we have and it just it's just so beautiful, it may not fit their, their needs. So we need to really understand what the societal needs are if we want to survive ourselves. It's, it's a matter of self-sustainability. Um, oftentimes, policymakers don't really know what they need, um, but we are uniquely positioned to help them because we do understand how the system works. So not in a condescending way, but we, we have those tools. And then we can help them out, we can help them find out what they need and then build a data and database and a, and a data set that is really fit for their purpose. And it's not, unfortunately, it's not a matter that one should fits all. It's actually the opposite. Um, and um, time series are phenomenal platforms for capacity development. Any of you that have run a time series or has, has gone to a time series know that you really learn everything from engineering to science to logistics. It really, there really are great platforms to form anyone, not just scientists. So remember that time series can also serve that purpose. Um, lastly, there's, there's a lot of activities that are coming in the next decade that are gonna shape the future of ocean, of ocean sciences and ocean observations. Um, the UN for the, the UN Decade of the Ocean starts in 2021, and next year in September of 2019, there's the Decadal Ocean Ops Conference that is specifically geared towards um, linking ocean observations and stakeholders. So there's, there's a common theme here. Um, so what we have to do is that we have to make sure that we're shaping ocean sciences for the next decade the way that we want to. We need to capitalize on these opportunities um, and especially maintain our high data standards and ma maintain our um, sustained ocean observations. Um, and I would, I would not remain idle in, if I were you, but that's 
just mine. Um, <clears throat> last, I got 10 seconds. Paula mentioned a Monday um, dedicated plan for the US. It is out for comment. So talking about shaping the future of ocean research and ocean sciences, um, there's a link. It's going to be available for 60 days for comments. I encourage you to go and comment um, because this is the decade plan for the oceans for the US. So um, don't be quiet. Make some noise. And that's, that's it. And I'm, I'm out of time. Look at that. Ah.